how is this um this group looked this spring what have we heard about what's been meaningful well i think the biggest question is how much of or the biggest questions are how much improvement will you have defensively and how different is the offense going to be with will stein the offensive coordinator who came over in the offseason from utsa after kenny dillingham went to take the job uh the head job at arizona state so i i think that so far, you know, what, what we've heard coming out of spring football, it's been pretty standard run of the mill, you know, individual guys standing out, uh, individual good performances, like the energy, like this sort of stuff. But until you see it on the field, I think it's, you know, really hard to know. They had their first scrimmage not not that long ago. Uh, I, I was not there uh, covering it, but it was, you know, not nothing's been overly spectacular one way or the other. And I think the spring game, for most people, myself included, is going to be a first real window into, okay, how is the team looking right now? Like, is the defensive line better? What's the continuity like on the offensive line with, with so much shuffling around and just, you, you know, a, a couple returning players that you're basically going to have five new guys going across the offensive line? What's that going to look like? Or at least four, maybe five, depending on how things how things go. What's you know, the depth chart at this position look like? What's that one? What's the development of Ty Thompson, the backup quarterback? They're just a myriad of storylines going into the the spring game. But the, those two I mentioned are the most important because Kenny Dillingham was great last year, had his moments where, you know, as a first-time play caller, he was, you know, showing a, a little bit of a rough patch, you know, particularly in the red zone. I think that was, that was kind of it. And, you know, there were a couple calls against Georgia that weren't great. That wasn't going to matter anyway. But I mean, nothing was going to matter against Georgia. I think we all kind of kind of learned that in, in 2022. But, you know, there were some moments where the red zone was really, really poor for Oregon offensively. Can that take a step forward? And everything else on offense was fantastic. We ran the ball well, had great balance, took shots downfield that was missing from the previous year. All of that was really, really good. And so now you bring in a new offensive voice who, you know, to this point has indicated he's not really going to be changing much because he said, you know, I'd be a fool to do so because of the success Oregon had uh, a season ago offensively, you, you know, pushing 40 points a game. And were they were one of the most productive offenses in the country. I, I think that's a good thing to hear from the OC, but I'm still curious what it looks like. How do you use this guy? How do you use that guy? Oregon doesn't have the tight end depth that they did a season ago because they lost two guys in the portal. Terrence Ferguson is hurt. So what, what, what are we going to see at that position? How do they use him? How do they adapt to that? And then defensively, you know, there are a lot of secondary questions, but your secondary can only do so much. They need their defensive line to be better. And, you know, a spring game always gives you that weird back and forth of I'm happy the defense made a play, but wait, why did the offense allow the play? Is our offense bad or is our defense good? I don't know. Uh, you know, it kind of happens on, on an individual level, I think is the best way to, to assess that sort of stuff is, you know, like this guy made a good play. He made a good throw. He did that and all that sort of stuff. And I can't wait to break that down and, you know, just kind of see it happen. But, you know, defensively last year, Oregon had a historically, as, as a program, low pressure rate on the quarterback. That led to issues defending the pass over and over again. You know, most notably the Washington game. Michael Penix goes into Autzen Stadium and throws for over 400 yards. Like, that was one of the most pathetic defensive efforts I've ever seen from an Oregon team. And it all started with the fact that they couldn't get pressure. I mean, they got out-schemed as well. Ryan Grubb, Washington's offense coordinator, was really good. But it was also a function of Michael Penix was sitting back there just – Pat, 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 let stuff develop down the field. And Washington's got some really good wide receivers. So th those are the areas that the, the Ducks are looking to to improve upon the most defensively and, you know, offensively. I think it'll just be about, you know, what sort of tweaks they make and do they have to change how they played last year at all uh, ba based on personnel. USC and Arizona State were two of the teams that were on the field this past weekend. There might have been a few other ones. But as you look uh, across the conference, has there been anything that's come out in the last month that's made you feel any differently about this uh, Pac-12 race? You know, not not right now. Um, I, I need to check in with Richie Bradshaw of Locked On Arizona State uh, to get a feel for what happened in the spring game. But I, I think both programs are kind of, you know, set in stone in terms of their, their expectations for 2023. For USC, it's conference championship slash college football playoff or bust with Caleb Williams in there. And for Arizona State, it's win more games than last year. You know, I, I don't think there's anything – 
that could happen in the spring that would radically change that. You know, I, I think the most compelling storyline between those two teams is what exactly is Jaden Rashada as a true freshman, right? That was one of the one of the wildest recruitments I've ever seen. I mean, you talk about the epitome of recruiting in the NIL era, Jaden Rashada, man. I mean, <laughs> it was it was Miami. It was Florida. It was neither. And then boom, it was Arizona state. And you're going, I'm okay. I, I guess, but Kenny Dillingham flexes muscles of being able to recruit high level quarterbacks, you know, whether that's Bo Nix in the portal, Dante Moore before he left Oregon uh, was, was going to be a duck and now Jaden Rashada to, to ASU. So I guess that tracks at some level, but I, I, I think for Arizona state, you know, if they, if they were to become bowl eligible this year, that'd be a great season. I mean, that would be, outstanding and surpassing expectations. Um, but I think they're just looking to improve, but for USC, it, it's, it's a high floor, high ceiling caliber of uh, expectations. Like if you're winning less than 10 games, you're doing something wrong. And if you're not in the back 12 championship game, something went wrong. And if you're not in the college football playoff, that's a disappointment yet again. So I, I think this is going to be, unfortunately the swan song in the PAC 12, as we know it, with USC and UCLA, but boy, it, it, it shapes up to be one heck of a season. It, it sounded like you felt as though uh, USC underachieved last year. Uh, no, not last year. Okay. No, okay. no, 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 not, not, not All last right. year. They, they overachieved last year. I, okay. I said going into the year, my record prediction for them was nine and three. They ended up at 11 and one. And so they surpassed my expectations. I think they, they surpassed anybody else's, you know, with, with the run they went on. But now that you saw that, and given that you are USC and given that you're in year two and you have the returning Heisman Trophy winner and you've got staff continuity, now you bring in Cliff Kingsbury as well to help offensively, all that sort of stuff shapes up for, yeah, expectations should be really, really high for USC. And I think that's a fair place for them to be. Sometimes fans have high expectations. I don't think that's reasonable. You know, Colorado is a wonderfully polarizing subject with Deion Sanders there and I'll, I'll have people come at me saying Colorado's winning one game this year again, maybe two. And I'll have people come at me saying Colorado's going eight and four this year. I'm like, if Colorado goes eight and four, I will shave my head even more than I, than I usually do. Cause that's, that's just not going to happen. Um, so I, I think that, you know, playing the expectations game, bringing it back to the fans we discussed earlier, just kind of big picture is your disappointment or excitement level needs to be based on your expectations. And, you know, last year, USC should have felt excited about the season they had. There weren't, nobody expected them to win the Pac-12. Nobody expected them to get to the playoff, but they were in the mix in year one. And that's a great place to be. But now it's okay to shift your expectations and say, okay, year two, now we need to be able to take another step forward because that's ultimately what you bring in a new coach to do is reset the standards and the expectations and then raise the level of play on the field and deliver the results that you feel like your program's capable of achieving. And we know what USC is capable of achieving. We haven't seen it in a very long time. I know they won a Rose Bowl with Sam Darnold, but that was like, a oh, okay, this is a good USC program again. And then Clay Helton ran them all the way down into the ground. But now they are back to being the USC of old and having – you know, a, a target on their back and the the expectation of winning at a high level, I think is more than justified. Definitely USC uh, of old on one side of the ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely they, they do a have to play defense. Yeah. No, Pete was all, Pete was all about big time defense and pounding the football. And Lincoln Riley says, I've got the best quarterback in the country. He's going number one in the 2024 NFL draft. We're going to throw it 40 times a game. And I don't care. They run oh, the ball absolutely. well, too. But... And all of that works, except they're not going to go too far unless they make some kind of fixes on defense, for that's sure. That's correct. And, and that's the biggest question, I think, for USC going into this year is what can you get in terms of improvement on the defensive end? No one is expecting or needing USC when talking about their college football playoff hopes to be a high-level top three defense in the Pac-12. You don't need that. You just need to be competent. Like you look at what they did last year that prevented them from getting a Pac-12 championship and a college football playoff berth. They gave up 43 points to you should never as as USC there is no reason 
when you are playing a conference game to ever allow over 40 points. There's no reason for that. You can recruit such high caliber players compared to the rest of the league. They have the greatest recruiting potential in the conference. I think Oregon is number two. You can go 1A, 1B, whatever you want. There's no reason to ever allow 40 points. I don't care who you're going up against, especially against a Utah team that really wants to play a ground and pound, grind it out game. Like that's allowing 40 plus to the old school Stanford teams. You know, it's like that, that, no, that doesn't track. You got to be better than that. Got uh, Spencer McLaughlin here, uh, track him on Locked on Ducks, Locked on Pac-12 and Smalls on Sports. Spencer, next time we get together, we'll have to uh, size up uh, these media rights uh, situations oh, gosh, and, and what all that means. But uh, unfortunately, don't have the time today. But yes, that would be a good topic. Yeah, it's it's always it's the ever evolving, infinite branches of speculation topic. That is uh, the, the Pac-12, the Pac-12 media deal. But yeah, great to be back on with you, Mark. Thanks for having me.